Hello, cybersecurity law class. Welcome to this fourth lecture in our module on computer crimes. In this lecture, we kick off a two-part series this week and next week on online safety. And we will talk this week about child pornography, specifically at the federal level. And next week, we will talk about child pornography at the state level. And we will also talk about statutes involving stalking, harassment, cyberbullying, and so on. Now, I've been practicing cyber law for a very long time, since the mid-1990s when I was in practice in the early days of the, of the Internet, and it's always been an interest of mine. My particular interest in cybersecurity law at the academic level here at the law school started about five or six years ago, uh, and really when I saw an episode of the show 24, and Jack Bauer saves the day from Chinese cyber hackers, and it got me really interested in some of the issues of national security and surveillance uh, and cybercrime and so on that we're talking about. And I really, all along, never paid very much attention to the question of child pornography or online safety. When I first offered a cybersecurity law class here at the law school, it was part of a grant-funded project, and I had gotten some funding from the Bergen County, New Jersey Prosecutor's Office. And I got to know one of the prosecutors there who does computer crimes and found that almost all of his work involves trying to track down and prosecute child pornographers. And uh, I became really interested in and, and passionate about this issue kind of from a social perspective and a law enforcement perspective because I learned about how really uh, horrifying and atrocious this problem is. And at the same time, in reading some of the statutes and case law and trying to think it through a little bit, also became aware as a lawyer about how difficult it is to find ways to try and protect children online without impinging on other people's civil liberties unnecessarily, uh, and while maintaining this unique space that we try to call cyberspace. So to introduce this segment, I'm going to show you a brief uh, video clip of a news report from a couple of years ago involving a large-scale child pornography ring. I have to warn you that um, some of the descriptions in this video uh, are a little bit disturbing. Uh, the truth is that what goes on uh, in this world is really dark and, and really disturbing. So if you want to, you can fast forward it, but if you want to learn a little bit uh, about how at least some parts of this underworld operate, take a look at this video. An international child exploitation ring busted wide open as the feds convict eight American men and a South African. The victims from a wide range of countries connected to predators through webcams. Paul Tilsley, live from Johannesburg, South Africa with that. Paul? John, Fox News has just learned that Operation Subterfuge, as it's known, is not over yet. A top South African police source working on what is a multinational investigation, coordinated by the FBI's Violent Crimes Against Children International Task Force, told us this child pornography ring stretches right across the world. The investigation is still going on, and more people are going to be arrested. So far, eight men in the U.S. have been convicted by the feds, and the Justice Department is trying trying to extradite a South African man who's been sentenced to 10 years for child pornography to the U.S. Fox News understands that 1,600 children have been drawn to at least two pedophiles' websites, one in the U.S. and the other in South Africa. The ring drew in children and pedophiles from the U.S., Canada, Sweden, Australia, Holland, and South Africa. Here's how the kids, mostly between the ages of 8 and 13, were drawn in. Pedophiles trawled popular social sites, such as YouTube, persuading the children as peers to go to the two porn sites. There, the men played specially recorded videos of kids as if they were live chats, coercing those visiting the site to perform sexually explicit acts, which were automatically recorded through the children's own webcams. The sites have now been closed down, but as we've learned, several of the conspirators are still out there. John? Ugh, just an awful story. Let's hope they get the rest of them. Now dealing with a major porn bust and investigators rescued more than 100 children who they say were being sexually exploited. Some kids as young as two years old. 7 Action News reporter Tom Waite shows us how the feds closed in on the suspects. 
This was a nationwide operation, but locally, Homeland Security rescued seven children being forced to make child porn. Continuing their crackdown on internet predators, federal agents lower the boom on hundreds of people accused of vile crimes against children. Calling it Operation Sunflower, agents spent a month rounding up child predators and rescuing young victims. As law enforcement officials and parents, you know, it's, it's, it's critical for us. I mean, we, our hearts go out to these, these kids, and it's, it's terrible. Here in Metro Detroit, seven children were identified in child porn and rescued. Rescued. Ten people have been arrested here in our area in connection with the exploitation. In some cases, these children were being phys physically abused as well. The victims in these most recent cases are as young as two years old. Agents found them by going into chat rooms, monitoring websites, and going undercover. Typically, it's, it's uh, on either chat boards or it's over the internet um, or, you know, peer-to-peer -peer on the computers and it's being traded and sent all over the world. It was just two weeks ago, Homeland Security Investigations tracked down this Florida woman with the help of the public. Agents launched a national search for her after they found a sexually explicit video featuring her and a little girl. Those children now are in protective custody, and the state and federal officials will work together to find them homes. Reporting from downtown, I'm Tom Waite, 7 Action News. Thank you. A Vancouver teacher has been implicated in a child pornography ring. Police in Australia have announced the arrest of 11 people. Two are Canadians. As Teresa Lalonde reports, the ring allegedly operated through Facebook. Chris Ingvaldsen is all over the internet in goofy YouTube videos and social networking sites. In June, police charged the 40-year-old with using Facebook to possess and access child pornography. Today news that those charges are part of an international crime ring. It began in Australia uh, by the Australian Federal Police. Like what? <laughs> police say 11 suspects, including two Canadian men, were members of a Facebook group. It was a private group formed to share child pornography. None of the images were from Canada, but now the RCMP is calling on Facebook to be more proactive and report this type of activity sooner. If we can stop it at that initial point, then we can lessen the impact on the child and hopefully, you know, lessen the distribution of their images and videos of them being uh, tortured. Prosper says this case took six months to investigate. Facebook would deactivate the suspect's site but not contact police. The suspects would simply set up a new account in a different name. Ingvaldsen was a popular teacher at an elite all-boys private school in Vancouver. Police believe he viewed child porn at work and at his home. St. George's School dismissed him in June. Ingvaldsen is registered as owning an apartment in this building. Neighbors are shaking their heads with the news. It is shocking. You know, I could have walked past him in the lobby and not known, right? You hear about it, but you never think it's in your own building. A second suspect was arrested in Kelowna and released without charges, although that investigation is continuing. The Facebook connection is no surprise to authorities. They say social networking sites allow people seeking child pornography easy access to each other and the material. Teresa Lalonde, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, welcome back. And as you can see from that video, there is some degree of organization within the criminal elements involving child pornography, although it is a very different kind and nature of organization, I think, than most of the sorts of economic crimes that we've looked at. This isn't, I don't think, uh, for the most part, kind of large-scale organized crime from Russia and China and so on. But what it is, is people who think of themselves as, as collectors, uh, who get together in these chat rooms and networks and and trade these files. But from what the prosecutors whom I've worked with on these kinds of issues tell me, the average person that they uh, prosecute is usually um, a young or a middle-aged guy uh, who's a professional uh, or has some kind of job and gets themselves involved in this and thinks that they're they're smart enough that they can uh, outsmart law enforcement. 